Before we get started, I've run all of the information in this video past a neurologist and a psychiatrist. And they both used two words that kind of clanged around in my head to describe uh, what I'm doing here. And the first of those words is clever, which, uh, yeah, two professional established men called yours truly clever. And the other one is dangerous. How is it dangerous? Well, under no circumstances should you try to do what I'm doing in this video. Uh, the field of neurofeedback is very legit. However, if you misinterpret any part of the SIA data that comes from your brain, you could literally leave yourself cognitively impaired. Now, I recently, just recently, figured out that empanadas and meat pies are not held together by some sort of uh, bread thread or bread string of some sort. I thought they were sewn together. So I've got the cognitive impairment game going pretty strong, so I wasn't too worried about it. If you are interested in trying neurofeedback for yourself, search for it on Google or Bing if you're one of those fucking people, and search for a neurofeedback center that has an actual neurologist working there. I've seen a couple that do not have neurologists working for them, and they also sell healing crystals and stuff, and I can't really think of a worse idea than letting one of those people uh, reprogram your brain. Speaking of pseudoscience, in all transparency, I am not ignorant to the possibility that the results and conclusions that I've come to in this video are a matter of uh, variables that I wasn't considering or even correlation with the fact that I was hacking my brain. This is also not officially peer-reviewed, nor is it complete. I'm not sharing any of my source code or going into hyper detail until it is, and is is probably never going to happen. If you're crazy enough to try to make new neural pathways based on what some asshole musician on YouTube told you, you are on your own. I told you not to. But with that out of the way... In early 2018, I decided that I wanted to start a project that would make either a limited episode podcast or an audiobook based on what is reality. And in that, I sort of semi-formally learned about everything from neuroscience to psychology to artificial intelligence to existentialism, and it's a really deep rabbit hole. One could argue that it's the deepest rabbit hole that a human being can peep into. This podcast concept is still a very early work in progress for me, but while driving down that road, I hit a couple speed bumps, and one of them is probably the most interesting thing, in my opinion, that's happening in neuroscience right now. So first, let's take a criminally incomplete peek at how our brains are physically mapped. They're a bit like the back of your television or entertainment center, except that the insanely complex wire nest of nerves makes up about 80% of our brain's volume. Some of these nerves or pathways we're born with. We've evolved to have them. Other ones we create subconsciously when we're children or even adults. And then some of them we sort of semi-consciously uh, create them by things like cognitive behavioral therapy. In a nutshell, there are two different flavors of these nerves. And uh, the first would be somatic sensory, which is something that you're aware of. It is hot outside. My dog is soft. This video Video sucks. The second is visceral sensory, which are things that you are unaware of, such as your blood pH levels. Your brain is constantly making adjustments to your organs and your nervous system using visceral sensory, and the only time you notice it is when it produces somatic sensory information. A good example of this would be your visceral sensory uh, figuring out that you have a bacterial infection, so it will send a somatic sensory signal to you to feel cold in which you will go put on a sweater which will raise your body temperature and give you a fever to fight the infection. To be fair, this is an incredible oversimplification of how synapses work and understanding neurology uh, to its fullest extent is a fascinating lifelong exercise in futility. So let's not get our foot caught in another rabbit hole and keep this moving along. The crazy thing is that these neural pathways, or more technically in this regard referred to as neuronal connections, can be unplugged, reinforced, or even rearranged. And that modularity when dealing with somatic sensory connections is actually what makes us individuals. So while it would be great to make your brain crave doing an hour of sit-ups every single time that you tasted cheesecake, we're just now broadly understanding how to manipulate these connections. But some things are easier to manipulate, like stress and anxiety, for example. While we can't pinpoint the exact neuronal connections that are causing them, we can sometimes find the result of those connections by carefully studying the output of an EEG. Anxiety almost always produces measurable EEG results as well as spikes in cortisol production. If we completely ignore the physical health implications of anxiety, and stress, we're still left with how distracted it makes us and 
how bad it is for productivity. I'm no doctor, but I do want to focus more. I want to work more efficiently. I want to be less stressed out. And like most people, I have some anxieties that stand in the way of what I want to be doing. So I decided if I could rearrange some neuronal connections. So after quite a bit of digging, I found myself a somewhat affordable laboratory grade EEG called OpenBCI. I filled up my Kindle with books on neurology and I started trying to analyze the data pouring out of my brain. First, I spent quite a bit of time establishing a baseline for everything from sleeping to eating to playing video games to working on music. Then came the tough part. I had to compile a bunch of stressful thoughts and things that were difficult to think about. For example, reading old hurtful emails or letters, uh, looking at pictures of deceased family members or friends, um, thinking about my dog dying or my girlfriend leaving me for somebody else. And I jumped into this anxiety and I swam around uh, for as long as I could stay focused and remain anxious or upset. Amazingly, I noticed that during the self-torture phase, my frontal lobe's gamma waves ran way higher than they did during the baseline. Now all I had to do was figure out how to willingly calm that part of my brain down. Oddly enough, what worked best for me was visualizing the process of swiping away an annoying notification on my phone or tablet. What if I can't afford my medical bills? Ugh, swipe to the right. What if my dog's pancreatitis doesn't get better? Shh, swipe to the right. Doesn't have to stop there. Work-related stress, swipe to the right. Social anxiety, swipe to the right. And when I did that, for just one fleeting moment, my gamma waves came back down to the baseline. But I can't just walk around all day swiping thoughts in my brain. It's extremely distracting and it probably gets less effective as you keep doing it. So I decided to shelve that until I could figure out a way to train my right lateral orbital frontal cortex to help me, not hurt me. And to do that, I'll need to find something completely and utterly meaningless that stimulates my reward center in both negative and positive ways. This took a bit, but the magic ticket? I'm an avid combat sports fan, and there's nothing I hate more than being really into watching an MMA or a boxing fight, and then you get a stream interruption. It's like I'm engaged in my favorite sport, and then just the action freezes, and I'm so annoyed. I paid tons of money for this pay-per-view and my internet connection, and I'm, I'm gonna have to call, and I'm gonna ask for a refund. Ah, it's back. And there it is. Anger, stress, anxiety, and finally, a whole bunch of dopamine. And sure enough, my frontal gamma readings reacted the exact same way when I did the other stuff. So I switched EEGs to a model called the Muse 2, which trades quite a bit of accuracy for portability and ease of use. And I made a program that simply paused a video stream whenever my gamma waves went too far above the baseline. And when I swiped away the stress and they went back down, the video would resume and I would be rewarded for it. I did this for an hour a day, every day. And within two weeks, my brain seemingly created new neural pathways that punished me for being distracted by stress and rewarded me for being more focused and mindful. I can confidently say that after months of doing this, in my personal experience, it has changed my life. It has helped me think, work, and learn more efficiently. And most importantly, I'm just happier. Our brains are really good at compensating, amazingly good. And this made me wonder if using the exact same medium would have a duller effect over time, or if my brain would actually uh, decrease the effect of the neuronal connection that associates my reward center with the video stream being resumed. So I changed things up a bit by essentially doing the exact same thing with the Super Nintendo emulator, but at a slightly adjusted scale, because in my case anyway, uh, the stimulus of playing a video game increases my gamma activity and therefore changes is my baseline. In case somebody watching this thinks that I've discovered or invented something, let me be totally clear. No credit is due to me whatsoever. What I dove into here is already a thing, and it's called neurofeedback, and it's being used to effectively treat everything from mental health issues to reducing the frequencies of things like migraines and seizures. It's an incredibly interesting and powerful field, and I am beyond excited to watch it continue expanding. Now that all the serious stuff is out of the way, I've popped open a heavily overpriced Oreo cookie-flavored beer that is just wonderful, and most of my viewers are probably wondering when the fuck I'm going to control a synthesizer with my brain, and that is now. The Muse EEG, uh, quite conveniently for a musician like me, communicates using OSC, which is called Open Sound Control, and is like wireless MIDI, and it can work with anything from Reactor to Max to even some Eurorack modules. But a quick word about the Muse before you throw your money at it. First and foremost, the company advertised and promised a development kit 
that uh, to be very nice, I would say, was limiting and frustrating to work with. So they went together and got a meeting and they're like, yo, should we fix this? And then they're like, nah, fuck it. And they just abandoned it completely, leaving quite a lot of EEG enthusiasts and even scientists and researchers very frustrated. Instead, now the official Muse app has some sort of subscription service that's like guided meditation, but in my opinion, to be frank, I think their algorithms are garbage. Uh, you establish a baseline in a matter of seconds, and that's pretty dangerous. It took me a couple weeks to establish mine. Muse does have a pretty crowded and lively Facebook community, but most of the posts are people trying to competitively out-meditate one another, so it's a... Uh... It's funny, I'll give it that. If you don't have any programming experience or ample amounts of patience, the Muse may actually be a frustrating option for you. Then you might want to go with my initial pick, which was the OpenBCI. The reason I didn't stick with the OpenBCI is that it took me longer to set it up than it did for me to go through an entire neurofeedback session, and I just, I ain't got time for that. That being said, to Muse's defense, there was actually an independent peer-reviewed study called, that's over there in the corner, Choosing Muse, Validation of a Low-Cost Portable EEG System for ERP Research. And Google that and you'll find exactly how accurate it is and I was pretty impressed. So while the Muse and the Muse 2 are actual functional EEG devices, they are what I would call Kickstartery. First, let's turn my blinks into snares. This is stupid. Now let's build a reactor patch that speeds up when my thoughts get more active. Still stupid. I'm just giving my future self work now. Ben, I want you to create a patch that creates calm, positive music when you're relaxed, but as you get more stressed out, it'll get more atonal and hectic, and then also maybe some quantized notes that are triggered by your blinks. After spending a lot of time setting this up and tweaking it so it works the way that it's intended to work, I'm realizing that this is by far the most ambitious thing that I've done in this video, and this is by far the most ambitious thing I've done in this channel. Uh, because I'm not aware of any neurofeedback that is based on music changing or on anything that would actually give you a temperature shining back, if that makes any sense. It's hard to describe, but it would sort of mirror your feelings so you'd have a better time guiding your subconscious stress. There's a lot of things going on in this room right now. I have a bunch of things connected wirelessly. Everything's running out of battery simultaneously. And not only that, but I'm speaking to a camera in which, you know, thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people will be viewing it at some point. And so that actually raises my stress levels quite a bit and makes me anxious. So hopefully I could get my gamma waves down to the nice area where the music will sound pleasant and it will reward me. And hopefully, uh, it sounds good and I can make this all work. <laughs> all right, so let's try it. I'm not, I'm not gonna cut, fuck that. All right, let's turn the audio up. EEG's working. Oh, I'm so stressed out. You hear that? I'm so stressed out. All right. Meditate. It's so funny because every single time that I get a little bit distracted and worry about the EEG not connecting properly or my camera going out of focus or something, I can hear it in the music. I'm gonna relax in my chair and we're gonna do this. The moment I get distracted by any little thing, I immediately get punished for it. All right, I gotta relax my body a bit more here.
This is something that I'm going to officially spend a lot more time on. There was a moment in there where the melody just came together in a way that gave me chills and it just kept me in that state and I could open my eyes, I could look around, I could think about things, but I just thought about them in a calmer fashion and my gamma waves just kept that melody riding. This is really, really effective. I'm really excited about this. It feels a bit weird to experience that and now cut away to a video I recorded yesterday doing the monologue, but I'm, I'm, I'm really kind of amazed. That felt really nice. I want to take a moment to thank all of the people who have helped me and answered my annoying ass questions about this over the last four months, uh, including but not limited to a psychiatrist who has asked to be left unnamed, who went through every single detail of my process with a fine tooth comb to make sure that I wasn't turning myself into a babbling idiot. I want to thank another neurologist who has asked to be left unnamed. Um, I would want to be unnamed too if it had anything to do with me. Uh, who really, really helped me understand how to read EEGs. I want to thank Stephanie Kozij and some of the folks at Emory University for sharing some of the research with me and shooting ideas back and forth. And I want to thank the University of Colorado for their tremendous amount of research and advisement on this. And subscribers, dude bro, thanks for subscribing and watching. I've been gone for quite a bit and I apologize for that. And I apologize for being a little rusty in my verbal delivery today. But what do you think about me sometimes doing music production stuff and other times doing techie and sciencey stuff that's sort of out of the music production realm a bit further? That's something I wanted to do for a long time. And uh, I think I might go for it. And hey, as always, if you learned anything today, subscribe to the channel. And if you want me to cover anything in the future, let me know in the comments. Thank you. Bye.